welcome to you tonight. And thank you very much for joining us on this, the first night of our mission. In fact, it's the first time we've ever had a diocesan mission. As you know, at this stage, our theme is Be Christ's Joy. So it's up to us really, isn't it? Cade Mila Falcha. And whether you're by yourself or with someone else, I hope you're nice and cozy tonight. It's, it's quite frosty outside. It was a beautiful day, but it's frosty enough. So I hope you're kind of snuggled up nice and warm and able to stay with us for the next half hour or more. The structure of the night and the structure of our six nights is we have a guest speaker. They talk for a while. Then we have a little piece of music and that's followed by your questions. Yes, your questions. And now, if it's your first time on Zoom, I'll say we're all quite new to Zoom, but well done. You're here and you got here. So congratulations. If you have a question, because you might like to participate and we'd love you to participate, there's a Q&A but, but, button at the bottom of your screen. And just if you feel you have a question that you'd like to ask our guest tonight or any night, you just type it in, click on the button, the Q&A button, type it in and submit it. And Francis Rowland will be working in the background to gather the questions and to come back to us after the piece of music and pose some of those questions. Now, to tonight, our guest speaker. Our special guest tonight, as you know, is John Connell. You may have seen or heard him before. He's been on radio, local radio, national radio. He's been on The Late Late. He has talked and has written about depression and managing mental health, his own mental health. He's talked about his own recovery and maintenance of his mental health through nature, through farming and through writing. He also writes in the Irish Independent, you may see his column, and although he's a young man, as you'll see, and as you can notice from the pictures, he has spent 10 years outside the country between Australia and Canada, working as an investigative journalist. And he's made his own films and had, had his own company onto his books, because this might be wh what you might be familiar with. Well, this book is pretty well known because it's a best seller the cow book, and I've read it and it's great. It brought me right back to living at home on the farm and the intense farming. And John covers it very clearly and the intensity of the farming, the whole story of the cow. But what really took me was his relationship with his father and the rows. It's so honest and it's so like the experience many of us have had growing up are in farms. So absolutely fascinating. I couldn't even summarize it because I wouldn't do it justice. But after that book, I began reading the running book and I'm not quite through it yet. But again, a wonderful read. It's the second one in this sort of memoir series. And the other night I was asking him, right, you've done the farm, very intensive farming, and you've done the intensive running what next? And he said to me, he's taken to the water. So he's on his third book in this sort of similar vein. Absolutely wonderful. So as you can imagine, I am delighted to welcome John Connell to talk to us tonight. He's talking from his own house in Longford. He's talking on our central theme, which is Be Christ's Joy. So, John Connell, you're very welcome. Over to you, John. Thank you, Mary. Uh, hello to 723 people. Uh, that's, a, that's a great uh, turnout and a great crowd. Um, I'm saying hello from Longford, uh, but I have a great affinity and love for County Kerry. Uh, and, of course, it goes down to the Barrow Peninsula. I was Mary informed me of that the other day. So... Uh, Kerry is the ancestral home of uh, my family. Uh, we came to Longford with the 1798 rebellion, but we were Kerry people originally. Um, Kerry is a place that I go to um, every year if I can. 
and uh, I actually spent my honeymoon in Dingle. And uh, I returned to Kerry uh, last year uh, after the uh, first lockdown and uh, I walked my first pilgrimage, which was the way of St. Brendan from Ventry up to Mount Brandon. And um, it was a wonderful uh, walk but uh, it was also a very spiritual thing and uh, Gallus uh, oratory and uh, meeting farmers along the way like myself and talking to people. And uh, it was, a, I suppose, a moment of calm in the middle of a, a very strange world that we're all in at the moment. Um, so tonight's talk is about being Christ's joy. And over the weekend, I watched a documentary on Pope Francis called A Man of His Word by Wim Wenders. And in it, Pope Francis talked about being called by Christ and that as long as the church is placing its hope on wealth, Jesus is not there. That got me thinking about Christ's joy and how we might take joy into our hearts to be modern Christians. And how joy is actually the foundation of our spiritual wealth. And just think about that for a moment. Joy is the foundation of our spiritual wealth. Being a man of the earth, I'm a farmer and a man of the land. I find the joy of Christ in the living. In the everyday. In the face of a newborn lamb in the form of a new calf brought into the world on a cold January's evening, such as we did on the farm yesterday evening. We had a young heifer born, and before that there was a, a little lamb born. Um, and there is joy in that creation and joy in that delivery. My walk with Christ has not been a straightforward one, but it's a walk that has brought me around the world. A walk in which I have seen Christ in not just the animals on the farm, on, on our farm, but in the people of Christ throughout the world. And I know it may seem like a strange thing, but there, there are people of Christ throughout the entire globe. People who have taken Jesus into their heart. And I'm going to touch on them later. John O'Donoghue is someone we all know, uh, someone who I suppose had a huge effect upon Ireland with his book Anam Cara. Now I discovered him a few years ago after writing the cow book. Um, uh, hitherto that I had never heard of him but people started to tell me that the message I was preaching in living a simpler life, a calmer life, was in a way an echo of Anam Kara. It was the work of the small, the everyday miracles of life, of living, of breath, of the new beginning that can take us all on our Christian mission. For me, and, and John raised this, for me, our Celtic Christian beliefs are our foundation. They are the one and same. The old people saw the imagination of God in the natural world, in the prayer of landscape, as John himself said. And perhaps I think that is what Christ wanted us to see. The world of nature is the face of God. And in being in our beautiful land, I know it's difficult at times at the moment to see that, but we can see Christ's joy. If you permit me, I'm going to read a small piece of writing that I completed recently that in a way echoes this thought and the notion of keeping beauty in our minds. It is in keeping beauty in our minds that we can be and have that joy with us always. So here's the piece. The land I live upon and in is known as the Midlands. Here in the centre of Ireland, we are like the navel of this ancient place. Below my feet lies layers upon layers of limestone. It is said to be made up of the remains of ancient life. Limestone is known for its permeability, namely 
that water flows through it, creating strange shapes as it does. Limestone has created amazing places, like the Burren in County Clare, a special place where the rocks have changed the very landscape. In it grow plants and animals that occur nowhere else. The stone, rather than be some dead thing, has created life where there could be none. Sometimes when I am standing upon this land of ours, I think of the meeting point that this place is, that the water pouring through stone has not just shaped the rock, but us. That in this midland, this middle place, this middle kingdom, we are meeting both life and death, heaven and hell, nature and destruction, that the permeation has made us the people we are, that it has permeated our souls. I thread softly over the stones, they are my makers. I wrote that piece thinking about the Celtic monks who lived upon an island in Loch Gauna near my home in County Longford. It's 1400 years since the monks lived upon the island called Inchmore. And I like to think of those monks at times and their view of a different Ireland, unconquered, free, but most importantly, that their faith was strong and unquestioned. It is that fact that connects me to them, for it is in the genesis of our faith as a people that I find the connection to the divine, that of the meeting of the two worlds of the Celtic and the Christian, our Christian spirituality. So the journey to faith. For me as a person of faith, as a person of Jesus, I think of the journey I have come on to be here with you this evening. To be a person of joy, we must, I think, face into the harder parts of life. For it's only in the darkness that we come to fully appreciate the light. It's only in the darkness that we come to appreciate the light. Now, my faith was born in rural Ireland on our family farm, where we prayed around our small living room each evening, saying our rosary in a way to give thanks to the Lord for our living, for our land and our health. It was, as the great Rosary Mission said, a family that prays together stays together. And that's something that we all need to hold in our hearts now more than ever. A family that prays together stays together. And that act of prayer was to arm me as a guardian of Christ. And it gave me the bud of faith to which my adult life could later bloom into being an adult Christian, because there are two forms, I think, of Christianity for us. There is the child and the adult Christian. And so many of us go through life and are still have the beliefs of a, of, a, of a child. And as to be an adult, to be an adult Catholic is to ponder our faith, to question our place, to want to be better Christians. But in aging and in traveling the world, I moved away from my faith for a time. Life was good, life was busy, and I did not have the time, or so I thought, to have Christ in my life. I went to Mass very seldomly. I lived in Australia, and I didn't think about Christ, even though he was thinking about me. And it's only when returning to Ireland, facing the dark night of the soul, where depression had affected me, as Mary said, and infected me in a way, that I came to know the Lord again. I think that this was meant to be. This was a mission that I was supposed to walk. It was a Camino of the Spirit where God was asking me to trust in him as I did as a child and to walk beside him once more where if I did he would guide me. In trusting to the Lord my life I remember it really well I was in a church in Toronto in Canada and I asked the Lord to treat me as a vessel, to work through me so that I could divine his mission and what I was supposed to do with my life. And there's a strange thing when you ask the Lord to make you his instrument. I don't know if you have done that yourself, but I did. 
um, to be a tool of the Lord, because in a way we are opening ourselves to new experiences. We are opening ourselves to walking with Jesus and to taking upon the cloak and the mantle of being a modern Christian. So how did I go from a young 20 something year old in Toronto asking myself to be an instrument of the Lord to then walking the road with Jesus? Well, I came home back to Ireland under the pretext to write a book a few years ago. But really, that was the beginning of a journey of the soul that lasted four years. I was someone who had traveled all my life, but the most important journey was the one inside. And when I trusted in the Lord to help me through this darkness, I began to see that my calling was a sort of ministry. Now, at first, I thought that would take the form of joining the priesthood. And for a long time, even though I was engaged to be married at the time, I considered entering the vocations. It was, however, in taking up my pen and the word that I discerned that I should use my skills as a writer and a journalist to help bring the good news of Jesus to others. So in trying to divine God's will, I began to read widely and I discovered the works of Thomas Merton, but also Gustavo Guterres and the idea of liberation theology, uh, that the church was for the poor, that in working with the dispossessed, there was a closeness to God. And I was someone who'd worked as an investigative journalist in Australia for many years and had come as in human rights and had come face to face with not just the idea of the poor and the dispossessed, but the very face of these people and seeing them as people. However, during that period of reading, I was also experiencing a mental breakdown or really what you might call a mental breakthrough because that's what it became. I had to go through my own dark night of the soul. I suffered and I wondered, and it was only through my rediscovery of prayer and God when I accepted that being in Christ's joy wasn't always going to be easy. And I think that's something we can all take, we're in, we're in a pandemic, that being in Christ's joy isn't simple, it's not straightforward. Now I faced my darkness, a darkness that threatened to take me under and take me from this very world. And that dark night, it's not easy for, for anyone. Those who suffer are the people I call the people of the road less traveled but they in themselves can be our guides on how to be modern Christians. I think every person you meet, not only in Ireland, every person you meet in Ireland, you're a, a conversation away with a potential friend, but every person can be a guide on how to be a modern Christian. They can show us that we're not alone in our suffering. We never are. And that to suffer is also part of the Lord's plan because it's in the dark that the growth of spring comes. If I were to relate, relate it to weather, because I'm a farmer, the seasons uh, and the seasons, uh, it's in the dead heart of winter that we find our own invincible summer. Now, I came through that time with my faith renewed. I had scaled the seven story mountain and found my own Gethsemane, like Thomas Merton. But it was in the natural, in the fields of the farm, in the cathedral of nature, and in coming closer to the land, the land that sustains us. So in facing that dark night, I decided to take up the pen once more and write about what I had went through, to write about the suffering I had endured. And in writing about that, I thought that perhaps in being honest with the world and with myself, that I could help others. And so some of you may know, I ended up on RTE talking to Ryan Tuberty. And in talking to him about my journey, I was setting in motion the power of the joy of Christ. Because though I didn't know it the day I was on the radio with Ryan, there was a man listening to the radio who was on his own way to take his own life. And on hearing me speak, he decided not to take his life. My words, the words of the joy of life, and as such the joy of Christ, allowed me to save another life. And it changed my own forever. And it was a work that started my own private ministry. 
uh, of helping those on the road less traveled. It's a mission that has brought me throughout Ireland and the world, speaking to people about the power of the goodness of your faith, of Jesus and God. And you see, I think really, when you go through that dark night of the soul, that's where there's a transformation of the self and the transformation of the soul. And once you've done that, no one can ever take that away from you. And secondly, you have a responsibility in that transformation to help others. So how do we be Christ's joy? How do we take his love into our hearts? I think that's our personal calling in life, to discover how Christ moves in us. For me, it's with the pen and the spoken word. It's in hearing the testimony of the people of the road less traveled and bringing that to a wider audience. Last year, I was traveling along the American border meeting Mexican migrant workers, and they were working in the farms of the border regions making a living. They faced enormous challenges, um, being away from their families, facing health and worker rights concerns, and facing an uncertain future. And death to these people was far more common than it is to us because of sickness and poverty. But they were people of faith. They were rich in faith and belief. And to me, they're the real people of Christ. They were all of them religious, all of them holy people who were walking the hard road of Christ, the road of manual labor and long hours. Uh, but Jesus was close to them all. And I remember, if you'll permit me telling this story, I remember I met a woman who had been blinded due to pesticide exposure. And after a long legal case with the company who had done this to her, she received um, compensation. But instead of taking the money and having a better life for herself, um, she actually donated the, group, the money to, uh, three quarters of the money to a Catholic uh, Mexican women's group to help other people because she said she wanted to do the right thing. And she said that that's what the voice of Jesus told her to do. Imagine that, blinded, but also hearing the voice of Jesus. You can see without your eyes. And I think we can all learn from her that we must silence our, our minds and listen to the voice of Christ. Not only will it bring joy to us, it'll bring peace and wonder. And joy, I think, it's not to be found in earthly possessions, though we all crave comfort and there's nothing wrong with it. It's found in the doing of what is right, in the doing of what is holy. Following this way, it's often not easy. It's not comfortable. But then I always think Jesus was a rebel. He was a man who sought to break away from the status quo, to help the poor, to help the downtrodden. And I think now the face the joy of Christ is in the everyday interaction we have. It's in the voice of reason that says to us to act, to act before it's too late. We are our actions and that's for us. What are our actions and what are they to be discerned? That's our, that's our question in life. Being in the joy of Christ is about being present in the moment and being a soldier for your beliefs because in doing that, there is a peace and a happiness that will come. For me, in returning to the farm seven years ago, in returning broken, I became whole. And I also gained acceptance. In sickness, we can come to know the Lord intimately, but also in joy. And it's when, time, it's when things are good that we need to remember Jesus in our hearts. If you can have acceptance in your heart, then you too will know the joy I feel in my own life. And that's my prayer and wish for you all tonight. God does not see with his eyes. He sees with his heart. And we have to open ourselves to his vision. In tenderness, as Pope Francis said, there is strength and there is joy. So let's all bring that joy into our heart, into the everyday. Uh, I'm closing here now. I'm going to talk a little bit about St. Brendan. He talked of the notion of going on Imrams, sacred pilgrimages, to bring the word of the Lord to the world. In the modern era, 
uh, first of all, we can't travel anyway. But in the modern era, I do not think we need to take a Curragh and sail to America. What we need to do is make voyages of the heart, imrams of the soul. And in the, Mary mentioned I'm writing a book about water. It's a spiritual book. And I wrote this small piece about the soul, which I'll finish with. Life isn't pure, neither are souls. They are messy, dirty, earth-covered things bandaged in wounds and winds. They are, in short, real and whole. Taking Christ into your soul will open you to the joy of the world. It has done so for me, and I hope it will do so for you. Thank you for your time this evening, all 905 of you. And it's back to Mary now. Thank you, John. I am absolutely gobsmacked by your talk. I mean, the challenge, the poetry, the musicality in, in everything you've said, absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, and I'm delighted with this piece of music now that we're going to listen to from Corkman, Jer Wolf. It's the Holy Plough Land. And after that, Francis Rowland will join us with questions. But here we go, so Jer. To know that you stood in the holy plow land In the palm of your hand With the question and the answer To know that you spread with the twirl of your fist Where the silver trees twist Like a lovely little dancer Let me into your heart Into your heart like a dove let me into your heart, into your heart like a dove To know that you suffer the crowning of thorns In the agony born in the garden of a roses To know that you offer the innocent crown To the wise or the clown To pick as he chooses To know that you suffer the crowning of thorns in the agony born in the garden of roses to know that you offer the innocent crown to the wise and the clown to pick as he chooses let me into your heart into your heart like a dove let me into your heart into your heart like a dove To know that you are when the harvest is ripe And the blossom of white is our new jubilation To know that you are when the famine is gone And the shadow is drawn on the joy of creation To know that you are when the harvest is ripe And the blossom of white is our new jubilation to know that you are when the famine is gone and the shadow is drawn on the joy of creation. Let me into your heart, into your heart like a dove. Let me into your heart, into your heart like a dove. To know that you stood in the holy plow land In the palm of your hand With the question and the answer To know that you spread with the twirl of your fist Where the silver trees twist Like a love a little dancer So Thank you very much, John, again. And Francis Rowland, thank you very much for joining us as well now. Francis, have you some questions for John? I have indeed. The questions are coming thick and fast. So maybe we might begin, John, and thanks for what you've said. People are asking, how do you move from being a child in your faith to this adult Christian that you've been talking about? Please. Well, that's a great question, Francis. Um, 
You know, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, I was at Confession, and it was around the time that uh, that I was going through that dark night of the soul that I mentioned. And I said to the priest that I am questioning my faith. I didn't mean that I was losing my faith. I, was, I meant I was questioning it. And he said to me, and it always stuck with me, he said, well, to be an adult Christian is to question your faith, to read deeper, to understand it. We, uh, and, and our, our, my own parish priest, Father Sean, uh, who I mentioned in the cow book, we, we we've talked about this at length, that many people go through life um, with uh, a rudimentary belief system that maybe hasn't been, maybe hasn't had a life challenge mm. to it. So it hasn't allowed them to grow. I think in obstacles in life, that's where our faith can grow into um, an adult one. And I suppose asking ourselves those questions, the child, the child goes to the parent to ask themselves, to ask when something is wrong, but, but we have to be parents to ourselves. And I think in being a parent to ourselves, we have to understand our faith as an adult. And in doing that, we can ask ourselves, well, how do I respond as an adult? How do I, for example, how do I raise my children as an adult? How do I, um, how do I uh, instill my faith to them as an adult? How do I, as an adult, deal with life situations as a Christian? Um, so I think that being an adult Christian is a job for us all to take on. And I think that in reading about our faith, there is so many great, there's been so many great thinkers that have questioned this stuff down through the centuries. So the questions that we have ourselves are there in the literature. You know, for me, it was John O'Donoghue or Thomas Merton or Gustavo Gutierrez. It was in knowing that the church and our faith it, 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 it takes in so many different spectrums and allows us to discern uh, those things. And I suppose the question is, how do we discern? Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because one of the other questions that has come in uh, is around, have we lost connection with our own Celtic spirituality? Have we kind of maybe taken on a, a too churchy form of faith and maybe lost heart in it and lost conversation in it? Yeah, I think that... Um, you know, I think that the, uh, and, and if you know your history, the, the, the Celtic Catholic faith was, um, was grounded in nature and the seasons mm. and in seeing God in nature. And when, when the pagans were converted, it was a, it was a, it was a, there was no violence. There was, there was no, uh, no one was, was put to the stake. It was an acceptance in that higher power. I think that in a way, in our modern lives, we are, you know, you often hear the phrase, the cubicle life. We're living such a busy world. We're, we're commuting to a job. We're sitting in an office. And it's very hard to see the imagination of God in the world if you're in a completely man-made environment all the time. I think that in get, and I know it's not possible for everyone, but we do live in a rural-based country. In being in nature again, that's where we can really see uh, the, the imagination of the Lord. And I think that's where we can regain our, our Celtic Catholic Christianity. Um, mm. I think that, you know, when I went on that pilgrimage, the way of St. Brendan, um, it was the nature that was so beautiful that made me feel there was lovely fuchsia bushes that go up from, from Ventry. And I'm sure some of the people watching know, know who I'm talking about. It was the nature that calmed me. So when I got to Gallus Oratory, I was, I was a pilgrim. I didn't start as a pilgrim, but when, by the time I got there, I was in nature. And I'll tell you the truth, I never got to the end of the trip because a couple of dogs came with me and they were a long way away from their owner. And I said, I bet uh, they were a farmer's, uh, they were a farmer's uh, dogs. And I said, I better bring them back before they get lost. And, um, you know, but it was interesting. I, I dropped the dogs back to the to the farm and I got talking to the man and we were talking about living on a pilgrim path and it was just and I think really that was you know God comes in all different forms for us and it's only when we have to we have to listen out and attune our ears to it um God could come in 
the form of a farmer that I met, or he could come in the form of a refugee or a migrant, or mm. or or sometimes he can come in um, in sickness, you know. And I think that uh, that our Celtic, you know, I think John O'Donoghue hit upon it in the book. The reason that Adam Cara was such an international success was because it was preaching a very simple, intimate way to be with God. Um, and, and the church is built upon intimacy. Francis, we might have time for just one more question. So if you, you've got a few there. So if you had a short question now, maybe. I John. have indeed. Um, I suppose I might put two together. Would that be all right, Mary? Yep. Um, I suppose people are asking, okay, how do you quiet the mind? You know, that, that many of us experience darkness and perhaps in this time of pandemic, there is that sense of darkness. So how do you quiet the mind? But alongside that, I suppose people are asking, you know, our younger people, many of them may not be even here tonight. You know, how do we share something of this gift or how do we involve younger people in the gift that, that you're talking about, which is uh, ultimately that joy can come in the depths of, of, of pain and difficulties? Yeah, I think um, I'll tell you a simple story uh, that I did to quiet my mind uh, and I only did it last week. I deleted all my social media and I said to myself, I, I was spending far too much time on it. And I know some people use it to connect with people, but I was using it for, for work and the books and all this sort of stuff. And I said, right, I've regained an hour in the day. What am I going to do with the day, with, with this hour? So there's a bog road uh, near me. It's a, it's a community path. And it's, I go for a walk there for the hour every day. And I have noticed that I'm a calmer, quieter, more reflective person. And, you know, with the farming, there's periods where I'm just writing. And uh, for me, I regain silence and quietness. And I think silence is a, it's a very important thing in the modern world, that we all need silence. And I find that when I go back to the farm, when I work on the land, that I'm quieting my mind. Um, and then to move on to the young people, I think that um, I think that there is a huge hunger uh, in people for a spiritual for spirituality, for uh, for coming to peace, coming to understanding, coming to uh, reframe their world. Everyone wants to know what it is, and a lot of young people are looking to uh, looking to the East, looking to Buddhism, looking to things like that. And I think it's our job as, as Catholics, as Christians, to bring the faith, uh, you know, Christian meditation, things like that, to, to talk to people at the coal face. Maybe the modern church isn't so much about um, being at mass and sitting in the front row every day. It's about being with Christ in your every day. And I think that, um, you know, it was a revelation for me when I discovered uh, Gustavo Gutierrez because I'm someone who's worked in um, who's worked in uh, uh, human rights for a long time and, and he really spoke to me I only discovered him in the last year about liberation theology which is really about the, the churches for the poor and I think that um, what he said is really important but the church is for all of us and I think that we have to we have to reach out to young people and a little bit like what Thomas Merton did with the seven story mountain. He radicalized young people and, and showed them that, as I said, Jesus was a rebel. That, and I think Pope Francis is someone who we can all see is a rebel in his way, that he is trying to uh, bring Christianity to people who have maybe not, he hadn't been hearing it for a while. And I think that, um, and his message is, is radical, but it's, it's such a simple message. It's a message of mercy and it's a message of, of the Franciscan way, which is being a, living a simpler life. And I think that simplicity and silence are the things that we crave. And I think that's where the church uh, and, and we ourselves have to talk to young people to encourage them. It shouldn't have to be that you come to Christ through times of deprivation. It should be that you come to Christ in times of joy. John, you have... Put it so well there. Just to, to finalize, maybe, have you a sentence or a message that you'd like to finish your night with before we wind up 
because I, I can see you're a man that could talk all night to us. <laughs> yeah. You could handle 20 questions and yeah. handle them beautifully. Yes. Um, well, I think um, I'll leave you with that uh, closing line that I said, that, so that souls are, are, are full of wounds and winds and they're, they're not pretty things. They're dirty, earth-covered things. They're real and malleable. And your soul will go through all sorts of forms, ups and downs, but, but you have to take the knowledge that it's all a learning, that the soul is learning all the time. We've all come, we've all come down here to experience life and to experience uh, the growth of our soul. A, 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 a soul that doesn't grow is a person who hasn't lived. So mm -hmm. live, get it dirty and get out there. John, thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. You have been a wonderful guest on our first night. Thank you, Francis Rowland, for bringing the questions to us as well and pulling them together so well. Uh, thanks also to Father Jer Godley, who's in the background making everything happen for us. And as you know, all of this is a learning journey for, for us all, all the technology. And we've been highly dependent on social media, John. So we're not ready to turn it off. <laughs> we can't right. turn it off yet. We're delighted right. with the response. Um, so, but most of all, can I just say thank you very much to you for joining us tonight, wherever you are, whether you're in our diocese, Cork and Kerry, parts of Cork, or whether you're further and beyond. We're so happy that you've shared your night with us. And we'd like to invite you to join us again tomorrow night. Our special guest tomorrow night is Martina Lahan Sheehan. So in total, we have six nights. We're very grateful to you for participating, sending us questions. John, you've been a wonderful guest. So till tomorrow night, thanks again to everyone and Fonagy Sloan. Thank you, everyone. Good God night. bless. Good night.